I'm Bronwyn Walsh and you're on Native Ground. I'm sitting here with Robert Berger, director of the film Charlie Victor Romeo. Hi. And we are at Sundance Festival 2013. Yeah. What kind of work went into, you know, producing, directing this type of real raw footage? Well, the, the wonderful thing about this piece is that I've been working on it for 14 years. It started off as a piece of theater, performed in front of our audiences, originally in a uh, 50-seat off-off Broadway theater, or as we called it, on Ludlow Street in the Lower East Side of New York, as a piece of, of independent theater. It was amazing because it was realistic enough to attract so many pilots and so many professionals to see it, and that interaction really gave it the energy to last 14 years. And all along the way, so many people came to us and said things like, wow, what are you going to do to get this piece of, of theater into the aviation safety arena? Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are really thinking outside the box. And we were like, the box? What box? We're not in a box. And sort of coming at a subject that is so technically critical to saving lives and preventing error, but we're just artists, right? So our take on how to do that was very different than the way that they did it. We were taking it from the perspective of we want to show lay people like us what it's like up there and do as good a job as we can. But the difference between uh, actual pilots imitating this sort of thing for each other to teach each other and really, really good actors trying really hard to be accurate, um, you know, really was the difference for us. Yeah. Did you have any trouble on set with accuracy? The hardest thing for all of us is to understand what we're talking about when we're doing it. How do you say, how did somebody say, uh, say something like mock speed trim or rudder ratio or yeah. some other complicated thing? Or how do people talk? How do you know how to put words next to each other? And the most if, but that, but figuring it, but knowing what those words are, what they mean, teaches you how to say them in a sentence, yeah? The hardest thing isn't the complicated words. It's when the transcript says something like, you get it? And the other person goes, uh-huh. And then some may be like, look, okay, how do you know what they meant? You don't. You, there's no reference because maybe they didn't say, look at this specific thing. And the other person says, I'm looking at this specific thing. It's not like that. So it's really a voice print of what somebody said during an emergency. So you have to sort of, that's what's so amazing about the piece is that, and about the film, is that it's that the film is the recording of 14 years of canonizing the texts of these emergencies to the point where for that long we've studied them why did somebody say that particular word how did they say that particular word that wasn't a word that's obvious you know if like somebody says flaps you know what they're talking about you know but the things that are smaller that you have to really think about well what what could he mean and those are the things that actors that enrich the actor's experience because when it's one particular actor they might say it a certain way and dig into it and we might think oh that's the way it's done and then somebody else comes along and reads it slightly differently and both are really valid and both bring an actor to a place where they really feel like they're bringing themselves to the piece and that's magic because we did not want our cast to know to, to think about what was the regional accent of so-and-so? Where were they from? How old were they? Were they a man? Were they a woman? That stuff wasn't interesting to us because we wanted to keep a respectful distance yeah. from the personalities. We wanted our, our cast to be those experiences. And so to give people a chance to find the places where they're going to make it them themselves is really the, the interesting challenge in the text. Eh? How did you start off filming? I started off as a cameraman for CNN in the 90s and uh, pursued a master's degree in uh, interactive telecommunications and we're talking about multimedia experiences, transmedia experiences, interface exper interface design and ways to look at storytelling from different kind, different angles of technology. Um, and at the same time that I was doing CNN and, and other kinds of technological work, uh, friends of mine and I were founding members of a theater in New York City where, you know, in, in a small kind of place like that, everybody has to help. And I was an engineer at CNN, so I can make a, I can make a light system work in a small theater. I can make a sound system mm -hmm. work in a small theater mm -hmm. and start helping out. And all of a sudden you find that you're in a position where you can start creating art in a very free way, you know, not so critical, but, you know, for the sake of it, for the fun of it. And you start doing things like that. Uh, so for 20 years I've been creating multimedia experiences, theatrical experiences. This is the one that, that was 
beyond anyone's wildest dreams in terms of the impact that it had and the success that, that we found with it. Um, and the degree to which we're, we have to be committed to, to, to preserve it and to take care of it because of the relationship that it has with the professionals, the relationship it has with the people who, who didn't make it and, and the people who watch it. You know, we really feel like we have to shepherd this piece in a way that you might not with another kind of story. And where can we find your organization that you work with? With respect to the film, there's two. Collective Unconscious is a nonprofit arts group in New York City. You can mm -hmm. find us on the web uh, and on Facebook, Collective Unconscious NYC, and Three-Legged Dog. And Three-Legged Dog, when, when Patrick and Irving and I were looking for a place to make a film two years ago, friends of ours said, oh, you know, you should go talk to this guy, Kevin. And we did. Three-Legged Dog, 3LDNYC.org. And when we went in there and said, we want to rent a room and make a movie, he said, well, who are you? What do you want to do? And when he heard who we were and what we wanted to do, he said, well, you should apply for a residency for three months and come in here and get connected with our program, which is all about connecting artists with 3D technology to sort of archive uh, performance. Because, you know, for the longest time, dance, photography is a bad um, archive for dance. It's still, yeah? And so really video is the is the ideal uh, archive method for for performance art for dance for for music because you can record it at a certain point um, the detail captured doesn't do the work justice and Kevin's working really hard to get artists connected with the ability to archive their work in 3d of course we wanted to make a movie a feature film yeah. and so you know, we were really happy to connect with Three-Legged Dog and then leverage what they thought was going to be a sort of artistic archiving project with really what we wanted to do, which was push that, that medium closer to the action. You know, we really wanted to use that technology, not just to, to archive what we did, but to create a, a cinematic experience using the 3D in a way that 3D hasn't been used before. You know? Great. And where are the screenings for this film? Uh, right now the screenings are here at Sundance 2013. There's one uh, tonight and there's one Saturday. And then we're pursuing all sorts of excellent action to get the film screened in other locations. So expect to see it in festivals and other screening locations soon. Distribution-wise, how soon do you hope to get it out there? Uh, we're in negotiations right now to, to talk with distributors about how we want to do that. Again, that's the wonderful thing about being, a, being an artist and being in a place like Sundance where it's so much about meeting other artists, talking to other artists, learning from other artists, learning from people who have a lot of experience and sort of being introduced to all sorts of different ways because that kind of distribution is totally a relationship between the, the institution that's doing the distribution and the artist that made the film. And that relationship is, especially with our film, something we care a lot about because of the sensitivity that we have for our subject. So we want to make a really good relationship that helps us extend our film not only into the cinema, but also into all of the critical areas where people have told us for years that we can really help save lives, we can increase safety, we can do all these yeah. things. So we want to make sure that you know we, we're partnering with an eye to all the other things that we can do. What do you hope to take from this entire experience? What do you hope your audience takes from it? That's a really easy question. The one thing that I've hoped for the longest time that the audience takes away from Charlie Vidromi, and, and they do in the theater, and I hope that they do in the film, Anytime something happens like this, that's an emergency, and, and the crew successfully solves the problem, and they land the airplane, which is mostly what happens nowadays. Airplanes don't just break and crash anymore, in the 50s maybe, but nowadays it's not that. When, they, when everything is resolved, and television interview, radio interview with the pilot, and they always say, wow, that was incredible, you're a hero, how did you do that? And they all say exactly the same thing, whether it's Captain Haynes, the last captain in the play, yeah. played by Patrick, yeah. Yeah. or uh, Captain Sullenberger that landed in the Hudson River um, recently. And they, those guys all say it's the same thing. They say, it wasn't me, it was luck. It was training, it was preparations, it was communications, it was all of these other things. And anybody with my job and my experience that got handed the same hand of cards that day uh, would have exactly the same result. You should expect the same result from any of us. Did you bring any of the transcripts with you? No, I didn't. Um, but actually, the transcripts, an investigation into an, into an emergency or an accident, uh, the recovery of the black box, and then that recording is captured, and 
experts, I think, when we were guests of the NTSB when the play was in Washington, D.C. in 2008, yeah. and they had us up, and they gave us the tour, and they, ex they showed us how they produce a transcript, how they write the script for this cool. film. And what they do is they get that, that they recover the hardware that recorded it, mm -hmm. and they sit in a room with members of the union, members, get people that work from the airline, doctors and pilots, I think take 10 people sit in this room, and they play this recording. And the recording is hard to listen to because it's very noisy and, and it's not exactly the highest quality recording. Mm -hmm. But when they all vote on every single thing and they all are unanimously agreeing that this person said something, then that's what goes in the transcript. And if they disagree, then it says in the transcript, we think it was, you know, it's sort of like, and then if there's things that are irrelevant, they cut them out. Yeah. So that whole, that, that's how something that is... You know, it's given to us, mediated by that investigation. So you can see, you can read those transcripts in the United States, the ntsb.gov website. You can go there and look at aviation investigations. And if there is a, there's always a report, and the report might might take years to produce and be thousands of pages long. But as a, if if what was said during the emergency is relevant to the report, there's an appendix to the report, so you can actually go and look and see what these things are like, yeah. getting and working with each other and getting things done. The same thing with a piece of theater, the same thing with making a film. And performing that, that airplane in the, in, the, in the play and in the, in the film was recorded live. Two engineers played that airplane along with the cast to achieve what happened to the airplane and the sounds. It's an instrument that created by our sound designer that we perform with and recorded live. That energy is is variable. It changes depending on what's happening on stage. It changes depending on how the audio engineers are feeling and how loud we want to make it or where, where we want to, how we surprise the cast mm -hmm. because there's an alarm that goes off. It doesn't happen the same second every time it's performed. It happens a little bit this way, a little bit that way because you want to keep them awake. <laughs> yeah. You know, do, does the alarm go off after I say yeah. something or in the middle of me saying something or right before I say something? Because you're not really changing the transcript ever so ever so slightly you're changing the way that somebody would deliver a line are you interrupting them with a with an alarm mm -hmm. do they finish saying it and then the alarm happens so all of that sort of interactivity between the crew that's backing the actors up and the actors is that live component that makes things vibrate as intensely as they do it really it's a it's a puzzle that the actors have to work through every night that stresses them out <laughs> actually you know to make them stress out about yeah. what's going to happen next is, is visible on stage the whole time. I'm Bob Berger with Charlie Victor Romeo here at Sundance 2013. I am on native ground.